You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Who better to have on to celebrate the four-year anniversary of this podcast than William Ramsey? A favorite guest of mine and my audience, William Ramsey is a documentarian, lawyer, and author of many books, including two books on Aleister Crowley and one fantastic book on the West Memphis Three entitled Abomination, Devil Worship, and Deception in the West Memphis Three Murders. In this episode, we discuss the aforementioned West Memphis Three child killers as well as Jeffrey Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, Alan Dershowitz, and we discuss what it's like creating controversial content in the woke age. Welcome, William Ramsey. So thank you so much for doing this, William Ramsey. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. So we started out talking about the West Memphis Three. And can you believe that they're back in the news? I know, it just doesn't end. It's just a, a conversation point for us for years, so even before you started your podcast, right? Yeah. I think it was back when he went to his, his former move from New York to Salem, I think is when it was. And uh, Blatty and all those other characters. Yes. You remember that, which goes way back. Someone just, I, I forgot that I had written a comment on YouTube saying, I don't want him in New York. <laughs> I hope he gets chased out of here like he chased out of Salem. Someone just wrote me. I got a notification that, oh, Roberta, you got your wish. (laughs) He's finally run out of New York. That's right. He went from Salem to New York, and now he's going to Louisiana, right? Yeah, but the way he made it sound was New York is my spiritual home. I'm never going to move. This is where I belong. And I've never felt so at peace. Remember all those posts? Oh, very much so. And then he's like, I'm out of (laughs) here. Because he's had enough. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame him for having enough. I mean, we both live in, in, in uh, blue cities. Um, what's going on in Los Angeles? How's the crime and the... Well, it doesn't seem to be too bad in certain parts, but it's definitely getting curious and curiouser and curiouser. Lots of homeless and, uh, you know, just kind of the feelings of uh, decline, not incline. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm a kind of a California resident at heart, though. It's hard for me to leave. Definitely. New Yorkers and uh, Los Angelos. I don't Los know. Los Angelinos. Oh. Angelinos. Linos. Yeah. Always want to go home. So they just gave two interviews and I just wanted to play them. One is remarking on, uh, let's start with Damien Eccles. Okay. That's a good place to start. In a tweet sent Tuesday morning, Damien Eccles, one of the men accused in killing three West Memphis boys, said the prosecutor in Arkansas has refused to cooperate with new DNA testing. He says if we want it done, we'll have to fight for it in court. This comes just a month after attorneys for Eccles found evidence that was thought to be destroyed, including shoelaces used to tie the boys up. Now they want DNA testing. The public interest is only served by moving this along and testing the forensic evidence as soon as possible. The prosecuting attorney, Keith Crestman, has asked Eccles' legal team to file a request for the evidence to be tested through the courts, something they didn't expect and don't understand. (laughs) Why in the world, after waiting 18 months uh, to find this evidence, would the prosecutor ask us to go through this formality when it's unnecessary? Okay, so good old Lonnie story, yeah, yeah, and they, I mean, why would they want us to go through this formality? That's crazy. Well, how do they think that it's going to be tested in a way that would be legal without legally asking to test the evidence? Right. I don't. No, you're right. It's crazy. I mean, they're all pretending to be confused that they don't get what the process is. They understood the process in 2011. With the DNA, the, this DNA that we've never seen. No, it's crazy. It's totally crazy. It doesn't make any sense. It's like they're asking, why can't we continue to play this out in the court of public opinion? It sounds exactly like that. And I think that's what they're doing. They don't really want to test it. 
they want to just complain about it and try to smear the uh, authorities there in Arkansas, don't you think? Yeah, I'm still blown away by the episode that we just did with a statement by Damien Eccles that the police chief was fired by the way he handled the case in six months. Right. And what has been going on with the West Memphis Three case in the last six months? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, they've been complaining on social media, but besides that, not much. No, you're right. Nothing. Nothing in court, right? Just a bunch of <laughs> just a bunch of PR and uh, you know, woe is me isms. But I don't think they've done anything. And that statement imputing that it was all about me is very Eccles Ecclesologisty, you know, where uh, everything's about me and they're all out to get me. So it did. It fits within the line of his prior statements over the last was it 93. It's almost 30 years now. Unbelievable. 30 years. Wow. And I know I've said this before, but Dave McGowan, the late uh, researcher, I had a really insightful comment about the West Memphis Three, which is that it's not really about the West Memphis Three. It's always been about Damien Eccles. So why do you think Damien Eccles has that pull with people? Is it Satanism? Is he particularly charismatic, do you think? I think it's a little bit of everything. It's probably, you could probably, I don't know, I think a psychologist maybe have, would have the opinion of a malignant narcissist that everything is about me and that he thinks, if you look at the last part of his documentary that he made west of Memphis, he said he wanted to be the greatest magician that ever lived. So everything's about me. I'm the greatest. And uh, I think that, that all these things fit within that Within that time frame, he was probably the real driver of them getting out of, of jail in 2011. And I think that, or you can just tell that he's really the kind of cycle was probably the psychological leader of all three of those from the beginning to the present. So, yeah, no, but McGowan had it right. Yeah, I talked to McGowan about the West Memphis Three with Opperman back when Dave was mm -hmm. still alive. Great uh, episode. Yeah. yeah. So. He, but he he keyed into other stuff. Just people in the audience that didn't make sense. Like McGowan, for somebody who hadn't made the West Memphis Three kind of like one of his core in, uh, lines of inquiry, I think he picked up on a lot of stuff about that case that was off. He thought that they used plants. So that meaning if there was a tough question, he said there was a woman who stood up and harangued everyone for asking a tough, for, for the woman before asked a tough but fair question. Do you think that they did that? Do you think they were hiring people or are there people close to the case who sit in the audience? I wouldn't be surprised at all. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Online, I remember when I first was researching the West Memphis Three back in 2012-ish, around then, there were people online to me that were clearly paid provocateurs, sophists, whatever, people who were paid by PR to, you know, just go over that stuff. And I think there's still people out there today for certain other cases. I think I saw one pop up for Knox on my YouTube channel in my opinion, uh, that is a paid PR person. So I think that they're out there. If you have enough money, you can probably get a whole suite of PR services. And we know that Eccles at one point had significant financial resources. So it wouldn't surprise me at all with plants and people dissuading things. And I think creating kind of a environment where criticism of uh, the West Memphis Three was verboten. You know, you weren't supposed to say anything about their guilt. So I think certain things were clearly off, off the table or not supposed to be discussed about them, at least when I was researching it back then. So I, st I still think they're out there. Do you think that that has changed? It's, it seems like it's diminished. I think that the fever of support that existed for the West Memphis Three leading up to their release well, the release to me was kind of a high point and it seemed to kind of uh, eroded over time to the point today where it doesn't, they don't seem to have the same, if even close celebrity support, they don't seem to have the same money. And I just don't know if they have the same kind of, you know, ecclesiologists. I think that was coined by Je Trench Reynolds, who yeah. said, you know, <laughs> they're all ecclesiologists. So I don't see the same kind of uh, bigger, as big a group as there used to be. So it is, I do think it's changed, yes. Do you think that there was anyone else involved in the West Memphis Three crime? Do you think that they got everybody who was there? No. I think that there was a larger circle. There were probably other people involved in that crime. Uh, in my opinion, I think that the potential sub suspect of somebody else who was involved could have been this guy, Bojangles, man, they talk about. There were other stories of a guy who got on a, on a long taxi ride and took it for 500 miles away from West of Memphis. Very suspicious. Uh, so there were other things going on. They were networked. They talked about somebody they knew of the West Memphis Three, somebody they knew they called Lucifer, I think. And uh, I think it was the testimony of Alvis Clem Bly. And you can hear a recording of him talking about that this was a larger group. It wasn't three people. So uh, my, looking at all 
the evidence, I think they got probably the core people involved, but there might have been other people who were there that night, in my opinion. And I think that maybe that was Je Jesse Miskelly's, his confessions, plural confessions, were to point at the people he thought might have been the core core kind of motivators behind the crimes is Eccles and Baldwin, but there may have been other people involved yet. I mean, I think intuitively, if you if you ask me intuitively without any real evidence of that, but I would say there's other people involved, yeah. And do you think more people are speaking out about their guilt now? It seems like an easier thing to do for people because I keep seeing people online researching it and kind of taking a more sober, less PR view and look and kind of, I think Eccles has also exposed himself uh, he's obviously an occultist and writing books about the occult. He just put one out very recently. People said that had nothing to do with this whole case, but I think it's at the core of the case. Um, so I think that the public opinion has, the high watermark has slowly been declining. And I, I don't think it's really that popular to say that they're innocent. I mean, people can say they're innocent, but I think that the facts that are out there and are readily available to show that they were properly found guilty are so many so plentiful that it's hard for people to kind of get away with it because you can just show people Jesse Meskilly's post-conviction confessions. You can talk about Exhibit 500 mm -hmm. that was never mentioned in the, in the West Memphis Three documentaries. Um, so I do think it's changed. I think that some people are still relying on the kind of documentary mentality. I've seen a couple of people on social media talking about how great the West Memphis Three documentaries were and I just kind of responded with like, oh, wow, I really think those are terrible in my opinion. Berlinger. His career seems bigger than ever, though, Berlinger. Yeah, I was just watching something on Netflix about him doing this, uh, was it The Murder in Times Square or whatever? Right. Have you seen that one? Yeah. So. Yes, that's a that's a story that I, I follow because of the daughter of one of his victims befriending him. I thought, wow, this this was a real, the serial killer that really nobody knows about. That's um, about it. Cottingham, I think it was the name, mm -hmm, right? Yes. Cottingham. And I think that was actually produced by by uh, those guys, Glazer and uh, Ron Howard and Glazer uh, uh, produced it. Right. So yeah, it was out there. Actually, Brian Vronsky Glazer. was in there, yeah. I interviewed Vronsky about one of his serial killer books, actually. Who's that? Who's Vronsky? Peter Vronsky is like a true crime writer from Canada. Huh. But I think he actually had a tie to that case because he had an encounter with Cottingham at one point. And so that's probably why they brought him in as kind of a fact analysis or narrator, commentator. I'll check him out. Yeah, you can hear it on my podcast. Here. And, and definitely hear your interview. Just looking at the pictures of Cottingham creep me out. I don't know how that victim's daughter comes within two feet of him. Crazy. And I, he said that he was killing people every weekend, which is really crazy. I mean, I don't know if they verified all the people he said he killed, but at the end he said, yeah, I've killed 80 or 90 people. But he killed children, he killed young girls. And very deep into pornography. And um, S &M, that whole lifestyle, like that whole lifestyle. And you saw what happened to Billie Eilish, the singer, gave an interview where she said that I was damaged by pornography and people jumped on her. The press jumped on her like as if she had ripped up the Bible or something. <laughs> why, why do you think that is? What What's wrong with making that statement? You're supposed to like, is this pornography sex positive? Yeah, I think that's the way it's being sold. And it's feminist now. And I think I'm one of the few people who is uh, very out outspoken about it. And there's lots of connections between violence, uh, studies of violence and pornography. And you just come across the cases one after another. It's true crime. There's tons of stories of pornography being the stepping stone to violence, too. Right. Or learning, learned violence. And so the, I guess the straw man argument is if it's not happening to everybody who's watching it, if not everyone's becoming a serial killer, then it's okay. Then it's not having any damaging effects. But I think we're really um, very in love with pornography. It's a pornified culture now. It's a pornified society, no question. Yeah. I mean, we have all these celebrities who started out, Kim Kardashian. Right. Paris Hilton making True. these, making their own pornography. Right. That's their intro. And then, I mean, Billie Eilish, I think she said she was exposed at 11. And I think that that's the same as men. Imagine that's your cue at that early of an age. I mean, it's off the charts. It's really having the effect into real life. And I don't know what, it's very American to say that nothing you watch or consume has any kind of effect on your real life. That's just fantasy and it doesn't have any effect. I don't know why we have that.
in if you watch that uh, documentary that was the whole guy who was running the whole sex industry in new york it's like sex is positive sex is blah blah but then you look at what was happening in new york in those strip joints and all that other stuff it was like a disaster like people were getting robbed and beaten and there was a dark side there for sure right sex may be positive but pornography is something else so do we hit everything with the west memphis three I just want to ask really quickly, what is your feeling about people who are speaking out now? You spoke out when it was really difficult to speak out. I've witnessed it. You got such pushback and negativity. When you see people speaking out now, do you kind of like, oh, well, it's easy now. Of course, you're speaking out. Do you have a little bit of a <laughs> resentment? No, I, I think that I walked into kind of like the hornet's nest, not knowing it that, that how bad it was. So that was kind of a first experience for me. I think at that time when I really, you know, when I put my book out, that was right after 2011, after that it got out. So it was like either the optimal or such a least optimal time to put that out. So they were, people were pissed. I mean, they were tried to sue me. They got my book taken off of Amazon, wow. but uh, I don't really have any regrets. It taught me a lot. And uh, it's a great book. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe at some t other time they can take a higher, more risk when it's the less popular, but uh, I don't, I don't have any regrets. And I, 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 everything I wrote in that book, I think stands true. If I would rewrite it or add something to it, I would have included, which nobody really mentions is the appeal, which affirmed the lower court. So it kind of goes against, and that's kind of the way the system is created is to have appeals, but the appeal has affirmed almost everything from the lower court, all the decisions, all the facts, all that stuff. So I would have included that in uh, as an appendix into that book. So maybe I'll put that in there at some, some point. But no, no, I don't have any regrets. It's really interesting that they base their whole defense on this idea of satanic panic or kind of a moral panic or a panic among the, t uh, the small town in uh, Arkansas that that's what caused this, of course, tunnel vision investigation. I got called an evangelical Christian over and over again. I said... I'm not an evangelical. I'm an ex-Catholic. What are you talking about? I'm not even from the Midwest. People call me a hillbilly. They called me as saying, you know, saying they're guilty, which is an objective fact in any court of law. It was kind of funny, the name calling and stuff like that. I found it interesting. They tried to put me in those like a uh, boss hog, like a Confederate flag. <laughs> like I live in California. I don't even know what you're talking about. They called me a, a Christian too. So <laughs> But yeah, I didn't fine. get, I don't want to make it seem like I got half the amount of uh, pushback that you did. I did get a lot, but not, not what you did. We were out in the uh, forefront taking the hits. And I think it's interesting because if you look at the time, there were all these celebrities to get to free them. I'm talking about the campaign to free them. If you look at the campaign to free them, I would call it a panic or a kind of social contagion yeah. or a kind of delirium that went around freeing them. And yeah, good point. Yeah. It's just gone now. It's just like, where are all the supporters? You don't see, even with this new evidence, here's the press joining in and backing up the West Memphis Three, not asking any critical questions, not even asking the right questions, not knowing anything. Right. Where are the celebrities? Where are they? I don't know, but. That's a great point. So the satanic panic gets brought up. What about the opposite of that, which is there has to be a new term for like the celebrity craze that all the celebrities jump on because they sense something's wrong. <laughs> we have to come up with a new phrase for that where they've got it completely wrong. So like they keep popping up again, like Susan Sarandon pops up with this, they got this new killer out. <laughs> what was the guy's name who they're like convinced is wrong? Justin Flom or whatever's back. So they create this inverted craze. So this, the kind of sober, rational people. Are you talking about Glossop in Oklahoma? Yeah, I think it's Glossop, uh -huh. yeah. So Sir, Sir Randon got it wrong with Abbott, right? Who I mentioned in Abomination, uh, the celebrity craze. So the satanic panic is used as some, it's almost, I mean, it's used as like a loaded phrase, like conspiracy theorists, where if you are upset, you're a, you know, a church going Sunday, ultra moralist and all this other stuff. But. Yeah, there has to be something for this kind of like innocence fraud, uh, celebrity, Hollywood, social movement where they couldn't be more wrong, but it gives them the purpose and service to make themselves look woke and moralistic. It's kind of like a postmodern moralism, so it's not a Christian one or a Jewish one. It's something different, but they get to clothe themselves in the uh, finest white raiment, so to speak. So whatever it is, it's something wrong with you, which means don't listen to William Ramsey. Don't listen to Roberta. They're terrible people. 
so they never have to talk about the evidence. It's always something wrong with you. Right, that's true. Yeah, I've been called crazy. Everyone. Oh, stupid, crazy, <laughs> naive. <laughs> you can name it. I've got it all, man. I need I mean, all the all the you know insults you can imagine. Anyway, but the things stand for themselves. That's the whole thing. Facts are facts. You know, I, I didn't make those facts. Up. So what do you think happened when Bob Ruff came to the West Memphis Three and, and said, I'd like to t test the evidence? What do you think that's like as a guilty person? <laughs> like, well, um, yeah. Well, you can test everything. Just make sure you don't test that one piece right there. Because that one, um, yeah, that just, there's some props. You know, that's due to satanic panic. But you can test everything else, Bob. Like Bob, you know, there's not a, there's not, there's not a uh, squirrel up that tree. Stop barking up that tree. It's not the squirrels <laughs> on the other tree, right? The squirrels up the other tree. <laughs> like there's some pictures of him with the full pig. Like he's got the full pig in the um in the trench. He's going to show how these ravenous turtles attacked it. Like. Well, they well one of them was alive. The turtles attacked them while they were alive. When has that happened? Right. And uh, watch right. the comment section be filled with people who got bit by a turtle, not not fatally attacked. I always go back to Amy Berg on the View, where she said giant prehistoric <laughs> beasts. Do you remember that? Where she oh, said that, remember. like they turned them into these huge, vicious things. And then he was with what are those guys from the True Crime? Uh, Zambetti, the other guy was the ex FBI. Agent. Clemente. That Bob. Uh -huh. Yeah, Clemente. Yeah. What was his what's his show? It's Zambetti, Clemente, and that other girl. They did a terrible job on the West Memphis Street. Just oh, like Jim Clemente was the spokesperson or or the expert for Amanda Knox for a long time. So But no, there's pictures of Bob Ruff and them together. They're very much alike. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. So this is a perfect uh segue into Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox is now out on claiming that she almost killed herself in prison. Almost. I mean, there's another prosecution complex, right? Fake part prosecution complex. That's what her and Eccles have in common, in my opinion. Yeah. So what what do you think that that gives her and Eccles too to tell all these same sob stories? I was remembering uh, Eccles said he befriended. I can't remember if it was bugs or creatures in his prison cell. Remember that in this book? Yes. So, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And so that's a, sort of a cliche of a prisoner. Right. Didn't you say that? Like some of his stories were clearly taken from like other prison story cliches. Like it was, didn't, it sounded like he was making them up. Yeah. Beaten by guards and given a welcome to the, yeah. welcome to the <laughs> unit party. Right. Which is just, all of it just seems so cliche, like straight out of a little yeah, bit. Like a hard boiled prison novel. Like it's just not real. And we know he's in, he's in, he's in solitary confinement, right? So Absolutely. His whole stories, public stories about getting stabbed and stuff like that are fluke. Like, I'm afraid I was looking over my shoulder my whole life while I was alone in my in my jail by myself. I think there's something, I mean, I, I know we were going to move on to Amanda Knox, but back to Eccles. There's something about Eccles, the way he tells a story. It is very compelling, and he tells it with a straight face and with absolute intensity. That it's hard to imagine he's lying if you don't know better. No? I think you're right. No, I totally agree. I think he's a better than average liar. I think that it's part of his personality construct is kind of like he might be thinking in his mind, like, I'm going to focus my whole will on this and really get this person to believe me. Whereas like another liar may just casually be lying. Like I showed certain things on my YouTube where I think he's done rehearsed his lines where he looks up at certain points at the same time. So I think that you're right. I do think he's putting a lot more effort into it. So back to Amanda Knox. She's saying that she almost committed suicide in prison, and it was a terrible time for her. She could see no future. Very interesting quote. She could see no future with a man. So that is what made her want to commit suicide, which I thought was very interesting. It wasn't so much about the family that she could have, but just the relationship itself. So I think that really supports my theory that her ego is around the approval and companionship of men no i think that makes sense absolutely yeah so so this was printed by the new york post which is our conservative paper and it's clear that she's on a pr junket so what is she selling besides her podcast are they want to promote this podcast so badly 
I mean, it just seems like it never ends. It's been going for six months straight. New York Times articles, interviews. She's just never out of the public eye. And what are they promoting exactly? What's the product? Is the product this podcast that she's promoting? Or is there something else? I mean, why is she in the spotlight all the time, do you think? It's a good question. Maybe it's just her trying to win the court of public opinion that she lost in court. Mm. She had that Clunia conviction. She spent four years in jail. And maybe she's trying to turn people who are on the fence into believers that she was unjustly uh, imprisoned and, and put through the legal system there in Italy. So maybe that's her thing is real. And I think that we talked about, I think what was back in early November 2021 about her on Joe Rogan. She kept saying very interesting psychological things. Like, I wonder if anybody will believe me. I hope to just live a whole normal life. Like she said things that somebody who's innocent, in my opinion, would not make. So she may be working out some of her psychological insecurities around the death and of uh, Meredith Kircher. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I I agree. And I wonder if they're going to keep going until it's myth. Like we talked about the Central Park Five. I would say that's pretty much solidified in America as myth. And here we have the West Memphis Three. We were talking about all the pushback. Do you think that this is their final push to just cement this as, as myth? Do you think that that is an important part of it? I think that's a good point. I think that that's very important. And that must be something that's happening that's not outside of the public eye. So somebody who's an advisor, somebody who's a crisis advisor or a PR advisor, you know, I think that the new approach when you are in trouble is to immediately go out in public and, and try to convince people. And I think that you can see that played out with, uh, what's the guy who shot on, on the rust who shot the girl? Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin, yeah. I think that's what he was doing too in that whole story with Stepanopoulos was really to try to get ahead of the story. So I think that you're seeing a real PR kind of strategy and tactic that uh, Amanda Knox is using to try to make it go into myth that she was, you know, little poor Foxy Noxie who was, uh, you know, abused by the, by the legal system. I think, I think there's one big problem, which is Amanda Knox and her personality. That will never change. And I don't think it will ever be popular with the American public. She's repellent. <laughs> I think she'll always have her core, core believers, true believers. But I think for most people, they find her creepy and, and repellent. That when you talk about her psychology with men, do you think that that was the core, maybe one of the core motivators for what happened back in when Meredith Kircher died? Is that yes. she was jealous of him? That's my theory on it. Yes. I don't know. This is one of my theories that she, that she armed herself with these men as kind of protection. And here she it was like three against one and, and she felt powerful. And that's how the murder happened. That's part of my theory. And she didn't feel powerful. I'm just a speculation. Yeah. But she didn't feel powerful because Meredith maybe was more confident and, you know, had met a different caliber of men, perhaps, or was going off with men that she wasn't invited in, right? Right. And Meredith was everything Amanda Knox wanted to be. Smart, intellectual, well-liked, charismatic, beautiful. I mean, Amanda Knox was pretty. She had a good figure. She was pretty as a young girl, and that's what she had. She didn't have much more than that. And so when you don't have anything else, that becomes tremendously important, that men like you. So I think she was a threat, and um, I'm just very curious to see this go on and on and on. It's just like and none of these stories stop. Did you watch the Alec Baldwin interview? Very much in detail. You know, I looked through all that stuff. I was really interested because I knew it was a setup when Stephanopoulos is there. And so they edited a lot of that stuff as well in that interview. And I thought that in me kind of like as a critical and uh, critically analyzing that, just what he said just didn't make sense. And something else was going on in that situation other than simple negligence, in my opinion. It really was like a Prince Andrew Jr. interview. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what were you Not as quite as bad, like, not quite as much of a disaster, but really terrible. Yeah. Terrible. I, it's now we to believe that this is a magical gun that just goes off on its own. It's so much victim blaming. Right. She told me where to hold it. She basically, she asked for it. That was basically his argument. Right. She asked for it. She asked me to hold it. Point the gun here. Yeah. Fire it. Even though I had training that told me not to point a gun at anything I didn't want to shoot. Well, the cinematographer, someone junior to me on the set is telling me to do something. So I had to do it. 
it just didn't make sense. And they're both Epstein associated. They're both Epstein yes. too, which is even creepy. Did you see the video of him in front of Woody Allen's of townhouse? No, but they're all friends, right? So Epstein and Allen yes. and, and Baldwin are all buds, right? It just creeped me out when the butler opened the door and there's a young male butler opening the door for them. And they were outside seemingly forever. I don't know for why so I'll long. I'll have to go check that Yeah, out. I'll send it to you. I'll check it. But I mean, Stephanopoulos is a, you know, cover, not a cover guy, but he's a politically connected journalist. He's not objective at all. So that when he sit down with that guy, you know, you're going to get served up questions. And that's exactly what we saw, I think. In that. And I think it's very important to see like a, that's really kind of an insight for the, I mean, the average person maybe who isn't in Washington or some of these other media centers of how to conduct a, you know, crisis kind of interview that I think that it wasn't a natural environment. It was the opposite of a natural environment, in my opinion. If you looked at all that stuff and all those questions and him dodging, I don't know who didn't, who did it, but it wasn't me. Like he just totally absolved himself from responsibility. If you look at uh, the Colt 45, I think it was a copy, Italian copy of the Colt 45. You have to pull back the hammer and pull the trigger. So you, it's not just a one-step thing. Can't just, you know, yank that thing back. You got to be ready to fire. So, And with his background, I mean, I think Alec Baldwin is a perfect example of a celebrity who lives in New York, who is treated well by fellow New Yorkers just because he lives here, even though he's a gigantic, <laughs> known to be a giant hey, jerk. Hey. Yeah. And there he is in that interview. Basically, he has a history of beating up photo photographers yeah. going after the right. press he was arrested for going the wrong way on his bicycle by the cops he got really he was put in handcuffs because he got so rageful punch yeah people. punch people yeah. Yeah. so what do you little, think yeah. happened there do you think that that temperament has anything to do with this accident yes in my opinion yes so i don't know what was going on but there was leading up to the event a significant amount of the people who were working on the set said it was a dangerous environment. And they left. And they were out. Yeah. Yeah. And they left. So I think they're hinting at something was going on. I don't know what was going on with Baldwin, whether he's on meds or whether what was going on, but you know, it may have been, he may have been frustrated and this person doesn't know him, but there's something sketchy about that whole situation. I mean, I'm, it just doesn't, I don't buy that story. That's really what it is. I don't buy that story at all. I, it's a very weird story. It's almost like I said to Tuesday, I just did an episode about it for my Patreon. It's almost like a, he's describing a strip tease. Do you know what was also strange is that I think after that, then a bunch of people who were on set also signed like written documents avowing that everything was fine. I got I to go back and look at that. But that was kind of like, the crisis management uh, response. You know, you got to get everybody on board to say everything was fine, not bad. <laughs> so I was kind of, kind of like seeing seeing a lot of these steps as somebody behind the scenes puppeteering these guys to to try to solve or get Baldwin out of uh, out of his predicament. That's just my sense. Speaking of behind the scenes, Marty Singer, his law firm is Prince Andrew's lawyer. So wow. <laughs> he got the best. So this best. is the guy who was Tony Robbins' lawyer, and there was a big expose about Tony Robbins a couple years back, and they described Marty Singer as wiping out the Me Too claims of Tony Robbins years before these newer claims that happened a couple years ago. So in addition to representing you legally, they also managed your online profile, and he was also Cosby's lawyer. And it's very interesting that the two episodes that Charlie Sheen. Oh, Charlie Sheen. Thank yeah, no, you. All of Charlie Sheen stuff. That's a huge pace too. Mm -hmm. And Mark Ebner has said that he's the lawyer you go to when you're guilty, which I think is so funny. Do you think that Prince Andrew has now they've okayed this lawsuit with Epstein's victim, Virginia Roberts Dufresne to go forward? Do you think that he has any way of getting out of this now? Uh, no, no, don't. There's pictures of him and Maxwell. So of her, him and Maxwell. And in, in the court, I've looked through the court documents, the ones that she has pictures of her that she's taken at the Zorro Ranch that was in New Mexico. <laughs> that's she supposedly met up with um, Andrew there. So she's got proof that she was there. There's a lot of problems there. So um, I think you would do a lot better to just kind of settle and try to come up with some kind of negotiated I mean, this is me trying to have some public statement that doesn't involve him in this and that. Prince Andrew, but now he doesn't have any royal duties, really, does he? He's, all his titles have been taken away. 
So what would you say if you um, he settled this so he can go on with his life and get this unpleasant thing behind him? I mean, what would you say if you were his lawyer? If I was his lawyer, I would try to settle. I would try to get an agreeable public statement that doesn't impute him as much. And I would try to just give him the opportunity as my client to move forward with his life and try not to, you know, come up with anything that was culpable, either, you know, civilly or criminally. Mm. That would be me. I would be, I, that's what I, I think if you got in front of it, I don't think these, uh, these juries, if you look at Maxwell, I was dicey about her case. I, I wasn't really that convinced that she was going to go down, but they put her down for everything, right? Except for one charge. So I think that that would be a concern. Like, don't you want to move forward? How much money do you have? Let's start talking. I don't know, you know, what's going on in the background, but yeah, I think he's in trouble. Mm. That's, that's, that's really, I think they're all in trouble. I think Dershowitz is in trouble. Oh yeah, that's my next question. So do you think that he has any chance? Uh, I mean, does he have to show up for this trial? I don't know. I think that if they had, I'd have to check. I think that he will have to show up. I think that they will subpoena him. Oh, interesting. So I think that they'll subpoena for deposition. I think they're trying to subpoena her for deposition, actually. If I remember, I think Singer's trying to get her for deposition in the U.S. because I think they found out that she was in Colorado last year. So that's a whole other wrangle that's going on in court right now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So if this goes to trial, when will when do you think we could expect it to go to trial? If it, if it Because she says she doesn't want to, Virginia Jufray says she doesn't want to settle, so... How long do you think, where are we? I'm just trying to figure out about a year. Yeah, probably at the end of the year is probably something. I think that they still are going through the fact-finding process. Wow. So I don't think that they've even deposed each other. They haven't deposed each other yet. A year or two. So then that step has to take place. So we're looking at probably yeah, at the beginning of next year. They're, they're still wrangling. And there's still wrangling going on with her and, and Dershowitz. <laughs> I mean, there's so, there's so much crazy stuff going on. Dershowitz is suing boys. So it's hard to keep up with all these different uh, lawsuits. What is Dershowitz suing boys for? Defamation. They're the counter countersuing. So it's a defamation versus a defamation suit. Okay. I got to go back and look at that. I think it was something. I think something they said. But yeah. I mean, he's already lost. He already, he already technically, I mean, I guess, had to pay out to Castle and Edwards. for a He lost suit. that one? He settled. His, his insurance company. Yeah, his insurance company settled. They don't really talk about that, unfortunately, but it's very important. It's very important to Dershowitz. I think. That Castle filing is, uh, says a lot. I don't know why people don't read, read that in the, from the, even in the alternate media. Nobody even mentions that Castle counter filing for the, the request to expose the Jane Doe's in the early parts of the Maxwell Giuffre suit. But those are very important. I can't believe anybody in the alternate media they can't put it together. Four people. Wait, wait. What are you? What are you hinting at with the alternative media? Well, you can. The thing is, is that they were involved in in that case. As in, they intervened, uh, Dershowitz and and Cernovich before Epstein was even a public figure, or he was known what was going on. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself the question: Why? Good point. And didn't he make a deal with that deal that covered Epstein in in Florida? Also covers him as a interested party. I think they are trying to say that that was a, yeah, it was the non-prosecution agreement, right? Yes. I think it was supposed to be a global non-prosecution agreement. I mean, it's still ongoing, guys. This whole Epstein Maxwell thing is not done. We're, it's just getting, it's just unraveling. Do you think Les Wexner and Leon Black should be afraid? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. You know, I think that I would say that the, the I think that the, the current administration and the judiciary in general, I think that they're probably just satisfied that Epstein got arrested and suicided and Maxwell found him guilty. But they really, their whole case really should have started from the inception as, in my opinion, as a RICO case. It should have been much broader. It should have been much farther wide ranging, almost like a mob trial. They should have brought tons of people in. And they, there, there were clearly depositions and, and interviews with other people, but they should have had a much wider ranging inquiry and uh, an out, you know investigation that, that involved many more parties mm -hmm. if you ask me that the intentional approach was this so you think it was a kind of minimizer or a limited hang what, what the limited hangout right i think yeah you just 
Yeah. So, you, you know, you just kind of feed these to the people. And you see that in a, some of these bigger cases is that like, oh, hopefully the people will be satisfied with this. But it's much broader. And there's there's hundreds and hundreds of victims, many that probably aren't known due to language barriers and things like that. We don't know people from Haiti, people from Venezuela. So I think it's uh, it's a shame. But I mean, at least these two probably thought, I think Epstein and, and Maxwell probably thought they were going to escape and uh, that didn't happen. So I don't know uh, whether Wex, Lexner, I think he's, I think he sold off all of his yes. stock. Yeah. Uh, stock. And so I think that he's got definitely gotten some pretty serious personal, you know, consequences, but there's another guy, I think that the, the, they did an investigation on the guy who ran, not Citibank, it was uh one of the banks and they, they got rid of him, mm -hmm. CEO, Barclays, head of Barclays Bank. I think they did a private investigation into him. I think that Microsoft is doing an investigation into Bill Gates. That's really interesting too. It's just fascinating. What you really got at that trial was how important those phone books were. Yeah. They were just almost like worship, like bound up specially. They had to be in special places in the house. Each phone book had to be to the left side of the bed, to the right side of the bed in the office. And that was their currency. That They knew that that was their, right. their livelihood was in that phone book. But nobody's even attempting to answer the question how he got his money. Great question. It's probably somewhere in that phone book. It's probably where his money is. That's where his clientele. So he, there, that some people are interpreting that as a, well, these are my friends, but you could probably also apply that to them being his clients. All right. Right before you go, I've held, held you too long, but you've, this is in the last four years, you've done some great interviews. What would you say your best interview is? Well, I have to say, I appreciate talking with you all the time because <laughs> you're so well versed and knowledgeable, you know, much more about me than uh, innocence fraud and some of these other subjects. I've learned so much from you. So I'm definitely grateful for your acquaintance. So I definitely put our interviews up there at the top. I do like Cyril Wecht is really one of my favorites for a variety of reasons. I really admire his work. I found him to be solid and like almost, I can't find anything that he's said publicly that I could impeach. Mm -hmm. So that to me is like such a rarity. So I'm a huge fan of Cyril Wecht. So that was one of my, Cyril Wecht. So that was one of my favorite interviews. And he's kind of an old timer. He wouldn't use any technology. So I literally called him on my, on my cell phone and hid, <laughs> held the cell phone up to the microphone like a old reporter. So it kind of made me feel like I was a kind of a B reporter. So that was cool too. So I liked his interview. Uh, I did a recent one with Kareen Hutz about, uh, about the Dutro affair, which people can check out. And I highly recommend that because there are clear overlaps between the Dutro affair and Epstein affair or Epstein Maxwell. And uh, I really think that that was very insightful about network pedophilia, sex trafficking, corruption at the highest levels of power, weird silences, the public being really angry and not getting any justice. So I, I do think that that's at least one of my more recent interviews that I would definitely turn people to. So those are kind of a few off, you know, I've done a few offhand. Let's see, I did another one about the femicide in Juarez, which is still happening. I recommend people check that out. So yeah, those are some of my more recent ones. I, the ones that I did with uh, David Livingston are some of my more popular ones. So he's written a book kind of about uh, fascism and secret societies and how they're intertwined in the 20th century called Ordo Abkeo. So people can check that out. But yeah, I've done a lot of, I meant like 500 30 full episodes now. So I've definitely put, uh, put some time in. Yeah. And you're turning them out like crazy. <laughs> I've been busy. I was busy in the last yeah. six months. Yeah. I was really trying to kind of get some content together and see if I could kind of become more popular. I was at the 1.5% on listen notes, but then I kind of was tinkering around with my approach, but I'm trying to get back on track in the new year. So, uh, I've got some good ones coming up in the future. I'm trying to talk to some uh, cool people. So keep keep an eye out. I got some good ones. Great. Um, William Ramsey, where can people find you? William Ramsey Investigates can be found on any uh, distributor of podcasts, iTunes, Google Play. My uh, doc, five documentaries are on Vimeo. And then I have five books, which can, you can get signed copies at williamramseyinvestigates.com or amazon.com. You're back on Twitter. You're back on, are you on Facebook? No. I'm on Facebook. Yeah. I stream to Twitter and Facebook now. That's correct. Oh, and okay. Instagram. 
Okay. So, but after you got kicked off of YouTube or you got censored on YouTube or what happened there? So I was getting censored on Facebook and I was kind of sick about the big tech thing. So I deleted my Facebook account. I deleted my Twitter account. And then for business reasons, I kind of snuck back into the, the digital gulag of Facebook and Twitter under William Ramsey investigates. So you can kind of see me on there, but I felt like as my podcast became less of a hobby and more of a business, I felt like it was incumbent upon me to increase my reach. And so I kind of did that again. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not too bad. I, I definitely, I, my attitude towards big tech is a lot different and much more seasoned now. So if I get censored or kicked off any of those platforms, I literally don't care. I haven't invested a lot of time and effort there. So there's really just another platform to me, each one of those. So, but yeah, I'm back. What do you think about these new platforms? I mean, it's just, it's really interesting. I caught myself thinking about someone who got kicked off a platform for talking about COVID, like, oh, of course you're going to get kicked off for thinking about COVID. Like it's been normalized that there's some subjects you can't talk about in this country. It's very odd. But it's also a conditioning process. That's what people really should be scared of because they're conditioning people to self-censor. And I think that that's the most dangerous thing of all. So I think that they're, I don't, for me, big tech, the big companies are all contemptible. And I, the really what really should be scary is that people are interpreting these censorships as coming from big tech, but there's a decent chance that somebody from a governmental agency is telling big tech to censor you. That's fascism. And that if that comes to the public, and it has in certain cases, uh, if that really comes to the public, that should really terrify me, is that you're being centered by your own government through an intermediary of big tech. Well, um, Biden's spokeswoman said that they were going <laughs> to crack down on people. That was one of their goals. Do you remember that that press conference? Yeah, no, I remember that statement at all. And uh, there's a Shiva Adir- Adirai, I can't remember, can't pronounce his last name, an Indian guy who caught Twitter censoring him from the democratic party so the democratic party was calling backdoor to twitter to center him i think he's in law he's in a lawsuit right now it's very important not covered very often but if that's really part of the larger political environment right now every american should be really concerned about that because that's it's just basic fascism right because you see people who have a certain point of view pushed and you see other people who have a different point of view who like <laughs> I think I'm pretty Untouched. much shadow banned. Certain episodes are shadow banned on 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 YouTube for me, and other people who have the right right opinion are are pushed forward. It's very weird. It's very weird. I, I definitely know that some people are pushed forward. So yeah, I think that having, I mean, at least for me, was kind of a reconsideration, a reevaluation of just looking at these uh, avenues to distribute your stuff. So for me, when I'm on YouTube, I have my other two channels, like Odyssey. And Rumble set up that they just immediately import anything that I put up on YouTube. So when I go to YouTube, I don't even worry about it because I know a backup's constantly already made on another platform. So you can literally go to Rumble and watch my exact same show on YouTube if you want. So that's easy for me. And then I own all the stuff on my podcast. So if one podcast host or whatever out there, Deezer or Podchaser doesn't want to, you know, put something up or iTunes. And I haven't been censored yet on iTunes to my knowledge. Uh, you can go listen to it somewhere else. So I've really kind of inoculated myself from some of the stupid stuff I did in the past was just put all my stuff up on YouTube. You know? Right. Yeah. So you're on um, Rumble and what was the other one? And Odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E. I highly recommend both of those uh-huh. two because uh, at least Odyssey is like blockchain. So it'll just be somewhere forever and no censorship. So Rumble, I don't really trust that much, but... At least it's an alternative, alternative to YouTube. Do you think any of these new upcoming tech companies have any real chance of challenging something like YouTube or Twitter? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think Rumble is going public, so they got enough money and juice to actually be valued enough to become a publicly traded company. So that's something. So clearly, they people have left certain parts of YouTube. So I think that challenge is legit. So I think that there are different places. Like my attitude is kind of, like I said, like I just put them all, I'll put a go anywhere as long as they're not censoring me. So I I don't, like, I don't, I won't feel any loss if I am being censored or get kicked off of Twitter or YouTube at this Mm. point. I won't bother me. And I already got a strike on YouTube for insulting elite sex trafficking. They said it was cyber bullying. (laughs) 
Can you explain what happened? Yeah, cyberbullying and harassment. I did an interview with a guy called Memory Hold. We talked about sex trafficking among the elite, and they claimed that that was cyberbullying. I was cyberbullying and, har and harassing somebody for sex trafficking. So Google has taken the side of evil. No, it's very clear where they're, what their point of view is. <laughs> I thought I heard that happen to yeah, someone else too yeah. about talking about Maxwell. So they were cyber bullying her. So <laughs> yeah. I think she can handle it. <laughs> right. I mean, you got to be careful because I'm not making things up. We taught me and memory hold talked about publicly available knowledge. Like we didn't go and try to gin up some fake stories. So we were just talking about things in the news. And that was enough for a strike on cyberbullying. And that tells you everything you need to know about YouTube and everything you need to know about Google. YouTube put a QAnon warning on one of my <laughs> episodes, you know, with the little Wikipedia thing on QAnon. And, I, and, I, and it took me so long to get that warning off. I, so long. I, I think it took me about five emails from me, other emails from other people. And uh, that was unusual because usually if I have a problem, they fix it right away. Because I lost one. I was one. My old, my old original stuff is gone. I can't get into oh, it unless no. I sue them. So maybe I'll have to sue them to get it back. But yeah, it's gone. All the stuff with like the, the cause celeb killers, that stuff is gone. Yeah. All <gasps> that stuff, it's gone. Oh, yeah, no. it's gone. So my last, you can get this. I can't get into my William Ramsey investigates V1. So I can't even get in there to tinker around with it or tell people I got kicked off. So it's still there, but I can't get into it. But William Ramsey investigates version two. It's kind of my upgraded one. And I'll probably have a William Ramsey, Ramsey Investigates version three, perhaps. I don't know. But yeah, it's not good. Okay. William Ramsey, this has been a pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. Well, my pleasure as well. Take care.